So I thought it'd be interesting to compare the Erie Canal to the British Canal systems. At one point, Emily and I seriously considered getting a narrow boat in the UK, and as a result, we went to the UK, rented a narrow boat, spent time around the canals asking lots of questions, and learned a little bit about their system. Now, here in the Erie Canal, so far this year, we've been on the boat for four months, so we have a little more information about the, uh, about the Erie Canal. But when you consider that in the UK, there's over 2,500 miles of interconnected canal that are accessible by narrow boat, you know, I could only experience a tiny amount of that. And here in the Erie Canal, there's over 450 miles, or about 450 miles, of interconnected canals on this system, if you consider the Erie Canal, the Cayuga Seneca Canal, the Oswego Canal, and the Champlain Canal. So I just want to put that out there that I'm not an expert, but I'm going to give the information based on, you know, what experience I do have. So when Emily and I got to England and got down to the canals, we were immediately struck by just how narrow these canals can be. Uh, there were some areas when we were cruising when I thought, you know, this canal is not much wider than my boat. What, what happens if another boat comes around the corner? I mean, where am I going to go? What are we going to do? You know, and uh, it, it can be tight uh, regarding the structures on the canal as well. So like if you come to a tunnel, very, very tight. Uh, there's a lot of foot bridges or footings from old foot bridges where there's just barely enough room for a narrow boat to get through. Uh, the locks themselves are very narrow. So, it, you know, it, there's, a, there's a lot of having to navigate tight spaces. It's pretty tight. And then right on the other side of the tunnel, this tunnel leads into a lock. So it's a bridge with a tunnel and a lock. All at the same time, it is designed for certain failure. Pretty cool and scary all at the same time. So we're going down through this little bitty tunnel here in this 50-foot boat. <laughs> we only got about uh, eight inches on each side of the boat, maybe. Not even. Maybe not even, maybe not even that much. And uh, that's not the case on the Erie Canal. It's just, you know, wide open and, you know, you're never going to have any issues with any kind of tight spaces on the Erie Canal. At least I haven't. So while you're cruising in both places, you're most of the time you're going to be out in the countryside. And of course in England, from an American's point of view, it's going to be more interesting because you see things that, you know, we just don't see here. We don't see like a old stone building with thatch roof on top of it. This place is it. It's pretty, uh, pretty much what you see in your mind's eye. Yeah, very, very pretty. Uh, but in both places, though, you are basically in a rural setting. You know, here in New York, you're going to see, you're going to go through some areas with just heavily wooded, lots of trees. Uh, and there's going to be some areas where you're going to see some, you know, rural, you know, farmland and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's just, uh, it's just an easy, an easy cruising throughout the countryside in both, in both instances. So both of these systems had a towpath at one point so that the mules could pull the barges. And in the UK, the towpath is still there right next to the water. And, uh, but it is a path. It's not manicured or, you know, it's, not, it's just a path. And uh, in, in the mornings, it can, you know, with the dew and whatnot, it can be kind of slippery and muddy. And, um, so it's not a place where I would, you know, want to walk a whole bunch. But uh, the Erie Canal, their towpath, it is not near the water anymore. It's, it is a, a hiking, biking trail at this point is what it is. And it goes from Buffalo to Albany. And it is manicured and it is maintained by the state of New York. They uh, either pave it or put crushed granite on it so that these uh, mainly cyclists uh, can ride their bicycles from uh, Buffalo to Albany. It's a very, very popular. People come from all of the United States to ride on this path. Uh, in fact, I would say that the towpath gets used more than the actual waterway does. So the traffic on the canals uh, is also a difference. Uh, in the UK, it's going to be almost exclusively narrow boats. And in the United States, it's going to be everything under the sun except narrow boats, because we don't have those in the United States. Um, the people that are uh, using the canal here in the United States, a lot of them are loopers, which are these people that uh, there is an inland waterway system here in the United States called the Great Loop, and it's kind of a rite of passage for a lot of boaters, a bucket list kind of deal. And part of the Great Loop goes through the Erie Canal, so you'll see a lot of those folks, and these are going to, in many cases, be you know big liveaboard boats and whatnot. So uh, as far as actual traffic, in terms of the physical traffic of boats being you know near one another, uh, I, both 
systems, most of the time you're going to be cruising along out and just enjoying yourself, enjoying the countryside as it goes by. That's the norm. I just want to make that clear. But when you do encounter traffic in the UK, it can be a lot more uh, problematic because of the narrow uh, nature of their system over there. You know, when you get to a, to a place where there's a bunch of narrow boats on, moored on one side of the canal and a bunch of narrow, narrow boats moored up on the other side of the canal and you're, you're coming one direction and some other guys coming, it becomes a very, very, very small space in a, in a big, big hurry. So uh, it could be a little daunting for a novice boater. I know it was for me. Uh, we're over here, a novice, you've got so much space to screw up. Over here, you could be just going around in circles and you would never hit anything. So it's not a problem. The English and the Americans have kind of a different mentality about cruising. It seemed to me that the English, they may have a destination in mind when they set out for the day, but whether they do or do not get there doesn't really seem to be a big deal one way or the other because they can tie up anywhere. So they can be cruising along and decide that they're tired, that the weather's not suitable, whatever, and they can just pull over and uh, bang in some mooring pins, which are these big stakes that they all have on board, and you pound it into the ground so that you can tie your boat. And you can be there for the night. So uh, if they don't make it to where they're going, you know, no big deal. Where in the U.S., on the Erie Canal, things tend to be a lot more uh, destination-driven. You tend to start your day at Town A, and then you want to get to Town B. And uh, although there are places usually in between where you could tie up, you know, like at one of the locks, for example, um, but they're not going to have any of the facilities that they would have in town. So people tend to want to go to the towns. Now, the downside to the, to the British system is when you tie up out in the middle of nowhere, you're completely dependent on your boat. So whatever batteries you have, that's how much electricity you have, and how much water is in your water tank, that's how much water you have, and so on. So there are no facilities uh, available to you outside of what you already have on board, you know, and you also may have to like use a plank to get on and off the boat, which can be unpleasant. It could be muddy on the bank because, you know, that's, they don't manicure any of that. So, you know, so it's kind of like camping, I guess, uh, but it's nice. I mean, camping's nice, you know, it's just that there are some downsides. It's obviously not the same as living in a house. So uh, on the Erie Canal, the the lure is that when you get to the town, and I'll use Newark, uh, New York as an example. If I cruise to Newark, I'm going to get electricity that I can plug in to my boat so that I can use my air conditioner and anything else I have on board that's electric. I can charge my batteries with that electric. Uh, I'll have wa fresh water available to the boat if I want it. Uh, I will also have a shower. Uh, uh, restrooms for me and my wife. Uh, in Newark they also have free washer and dryer and they have a pump out so I can pump all the sewage out of my boat if I want to and, and none of this costs anything. It's completely free. The only thing that I'm required to do is when I get there I need to sign in with the dock master just to let them know that I'm there and give them my phone number so if they need to call me because of a problem of you know if, hey, your boat's sinking you know, or whatever. <laughs> but that's it. It doesn't cost you a dime. So as a result, there's not a whole lot of folks out there that are going to have a live-aboard boat and, and opt to not have facilities when they can go to the town and have facilities. And these towns also cater to the boaters in some ways. Like they'll, they, they'll, they'll usually have a pavilion or something where they have uh, you know, music on, live music on Friday nights or uh, you know, a farmer's market on Thursdays or you know, that kind of stuff. So there'll be events and whatnot that are down there at the docks. So downside for the Erie Canal is, is that you know you're, you're usually gonna have to wait until you get to your destination to be able to enjoy all the stuff that comes with getting to the destination. And I, I like both systems a lot. In fact when we're done here on the Erie Canal we'll sell this boat and we still plan on buying a narrow boat in the UK and uh, doing the UK system the UK way uh, for a while. So we think both are terrific. Uh, so another big difference between the two systems are the locks. Uh, the locks in the UK are just big enough to accommodate a narrow boat. I mean, that's why narrow boats are the dimensions that they are, so that they will fit into these locks, and it's a tight fit. Uh, 
you're going to have to do some work to get in and out of these locks because you've got to do them all yourself or almost all of them yourself so you're going to have to be able to open those gates and uh, open the sluices and all that and that you're going to want a, a pair of good knees and a, and a back that that is functional because uh, you're going to have to put some effort into it and uh, it's also a little slow because you have to dock first and then go set the lock and then untie and then pull in and you know so it's it takes a little bit of time but there's usually other people around at the locks and you know socializing and it'll help you if you don't know what to do or maybe you can't get the gate open by yourself or whatever so it's not like you're on your own and the locks uh, also they only hold one boat at a time so if there were say three boats on this side of the lock and three boats on that side of the lock it's going to be a slow process so if you're in a big hurry this is the wrong pastime if you're if you're looking at doing canals or especially narrow boating in the in the UK and you're in a big hurry this is not something you're going to want to do. You need to go buy a ski boat. Uh, the Erie Canal locks, uh, very, very, very different and much, much, much bigger. So these things are like, I don't know, 40, 45 feet across by two or 300 feet long. I mean, they're big and you can put a whole pile of boats in there at one time. Uh, there's no or almost no labor required. You, you, if you, if you have the strength in your right hand to hold the CB radio and say, uh, "Lock 29," and this is the Owasco requesting passage west, and you're you're done. You can go relax. Uh, when you get in the lock, you will have to hang onto a rope so that you don't go floating out into the middle of the lock. But uh, but other than that, it's really super simple. So the only thing really left to discuss, I guess, is the the, the boats that you're going to encounter. And on the Erie Canal, you're going to encounter everything under the sun, except a traditional English narrow boat. Even our boat, which is similar, is technically a wide beam because it's uh, 10 feet wide instead of the required 7 feet wide, or about 7 feet wide. Uh, so we're not really a narrow boat either. And uh, on the English Canal, you're going to see almost exclusively traditional English narrow boats to the exclusion of everything else. So if you come here to the Erie Canal and you're going to do some boating or you're going to rent a boat or whatever, you have all kinds of different options and just about anything will work. But if you're going to go to the UK and buy a boat or rent a boat, you're almost certainly going to have to rent an English narrow boat in order to have access to all the canals. So some things that you might want to consider that aren't so apparent from watching videos online and whatnot is one thing is the weight of the narrow boat. It's a steel boat, so these boats can weigh, you know, 10 or 12 tons and can be like driving a school bus compared to a fiberglass boat, which is more like driving a sports car. You got to move very slowly, take your time, and uh, yeah, yeah, being in a hurry is definitely not your friend. Um, you also need to understand that these boats are steered with a tiller, not with a steering wheel. So if you're used to being on a boat that has a steering wheel, and you're not accustomed to using a tiller, you need to kind of familiarize yourself with how a tiller works and think it through because it is not, oh, I point the stick over there and I go over there. No, you point the stick over there and you go over there. This is uh, kind of counterintuitive for some people. And once again, it could lend itself to you uh, bouncing off of everybody else's boat as you're going down the canal, which is going to make you a very unpopular person. Um, and the boats don't have, uh, the rental boats, uh, in many cases don't have bow thrusters which means you know now you're on a really long boat and you don't have very good control of the bow of the boat if you don't know what you're doing so that's something else that you need to kind of think through and practice and whatnot if you do go rent the boat go somewhere where you're not going to be banging into people and kind of get that all figured out before you take off uh, and put other people in harm's way uh, understand that seven feet wide which is about how wide the narrow boats are Seven feet is not a lot of space, and it's really tight inside those boats. Um, the newer boats, they've figured out more efficient ways to use that space, but seven feet is seven feet, and every time you measure it, it's still seven feet, and it's going to be tight no matter how efficient you get. And in order to pick up additional uh, interior space, the only way they can go is longer, and that's why these boats tend to be anywhere from 55 up to 70 feet long is because they're just trying to get uh, cabin space because getting wider is not an option if they want to be able to have access to the entire canal system. So just some things you might want to consider about narrow boats if you're planning on going over there and buying one and or renting one. Uh, having said all that, uh, we love the Erie Canal and we're going to spend more time here uh, before we will sell this and take off to 
to the UK and buy a narrow boat and do more of the same just on their system. So we have a very high opinion of both systems and the way they do things, and there are pros and cons to both ways, but there's way more pros in both setups than there are cons. Both ways and both canals are, are, are a lot of fun, and uh, we get a lot of pleasure out of it. So we would recommend that people try it.